This presentation has received written permission to include the copyrighted and trademarked Relationship Attachment Model, or RAM, and to be based on components of the RAM and the Relationship Goals series. Therefore, any reproduction or distribution of the RAM or this presentation is strictly prohibited without written permission from Love Thinks LLC, copyrighted 1987-2017, John Van Epp, Ph.D. Everybody, how are you? All right. Welcome to part three of Crazy Stupid Love. And uh, let's give a big welcome to all our campuses this weekend out in Redlands, Bellflower, Park Rapids, Anaheim, La Habra. Those of you joining us online, always great to have you with us. And uh, God is at work in so many cool ways, and things are happening at all of our locations. But this weekend marks a milestone for two of our campuses that deserve to be celebrated because today, Eastside Park Rapids is celebrating their fourth anniversary and Eastside La Habra is celebrating their third anniversary. So let's get crazy, stupid, rowdy and celebrate with those campuses. We love you guys so much. Can't believe all that God is doing and, and God is just doing amazing things through the lives of the change makers in both Park Rapids and La Habra. And I wanna say thank you to Pastor Justin and Pastor Norm who've been leading since day one at those campuses and all the great teams around them. And if you wanna know how to pray for these two campuses on their anniversary, we're searching for a permanent home for Eastside La Habra. They're the only one of our five campuses that meets in a temporary location. It's a great location at Whittier Christian High School. And so you can pray for that and pray for Park Rapids because we are under construction right now with a major expansion of that campus that is really, really needed. So again, we just celebrate with you guys today and have an awesome, awesome anniversary. So if you're just joining us, we're in a series called Crazy Stupid Love where we've been looking at the relationship attachment model or what we call RAM for short, and you have it uh, on your program. This was developed by a Christian author, professor, counselor, and therapist named Dr. John Van Epp in order to illustrate, in order to visualize the biblical sequence from left to right of how healthy relationships develop that honor God, the kind of relationship that God desires for all of us in our lives. But the problem comes for us when we get these out of order, when we, we get these out of sequence. Uh, maybe we rely on someone before we really know them, or maybe we commit to someone before we really know if we can trust them. Or one of the most common mistakes people make before they get to know someone is they, they touch, they hook up, they begin a physical relationship almost immediately, and now you have two people sexually involved, and yet they don't really know if they can trust each other or if they can rely on each other. They don't really even know what level of commitment is in this relationship. Which leads me to this headline I came across earlier this year. Man takes Ambien and accidentally proposes to his girlfriend. <laughs> this dude woke up in the morning and his girlfriend is wearing the engagement ring that he had hidden in the nightstand and he claims he wasn't gonna ask her to marry him for another year or so, but Ambien made me do it. Now, I'm not a marriage counselor. I'm pretty confident it's safe to say this relationship is off to a shaky start. Because here's where relationships are supposed to start. We're supposed to get to know them. And then after a period of time, we, we test whether or not they're trustworthy. Whether or not you can say, I know them, I've watched them, their words and their actions line up, they're a person of integrity, they're dependable, this is someone I trust. And then and only once you trust someone, are you ready to rely on them? Now here's the truth. I can trust someone and not really rely on them. You can have trustworthy people all around you but not rely on any of them. 
Today, I've titled this message, Risk to Rely. Because when it comes to relying on others, there are two extremes that we can go to. The first unhealthy extreme is we become too dependent on others. We go to such an extreme that we rely on others more than we rely on God. And maybe the relationship becomes overly dependent or even codependent. But the other unhealthy extreme that honestly many of us struggle with is we become too independent. Independent. There's a word in our vocabulary that's so pervasive, so much a part of our world, that it's hard to imagine. I've never even heard of this word a decade ago. And now it's hard to imagine life without it. But when I grew up, I never heard anybody use the phrase, let's take a selfie. But today we live in a selfie world. I heard someone joke, the reason it's called a selfie is no one can spell narcissism. Let me ask you, when someone takes a selfie of you, who do you look at first in the picture? <laughs> My guess is it's you, right? I do. When I'm in a group photo and I have a chance to see it, I'm not looking at my wife or my family or my friends. I want to see how I look. You know, do I look good, old? Is my smile goofy? Does my hair look okay? Do you ever say after you look at it, hey, let's take another one? <laughs> Maybe it turned out badly, you know? Or if it turned out particularly flattering, do you say, hey, send me that one? <laughs> Thinking you're gonna, you know, put it on your Instagram story or Facebook or whatever. Many of us have allowed an over-obsessive focus on self to lead to an abnormal focus on individualism. If it's going to be, it's up to me. If you, wanna do some, if you want something done right, do it yourself. Right. Watch out for number one. I got to be my own man, be my own woman, be relationally independent so I don't have to rely on anyone. The greatest love of all is easy to achieve, learning to love yourself is the greatest love of all. Don't encourage that. Do not. And then we wonder why we're lonely, why we've got no friends, no close relationships. The wisdom of God's word teaches us just the opposite. Look with me at Romans chapter 12, verse 5. It says, we are all one body in Christ. We belong to each other, and each of us needs all the others. Needs all the others. Turn to the person next to you and say, you need me. Just turn to him right now. Ah, oh, that's so touching. <laughs> Feel like I'm watching a movie. Now turn the other way to the person who was your second choice and say, <laughs> you need me. <laughs> okay, question, question. Why does this even matter? I'm glad you asked me that question. Because you see, here's something I know about you. In fact, I know this is true about every single person on the face of the earth. Every one of us wants to know why we're here, what our purpose is, right? Inside all of us is a longing that there's got to be something more. Have you ever felt that or said that? God put that like desire inside of us. We're all searching and longing to discover our purpose. The two greatest days in a person's life are the day you were born and the day you discover why. Look at Proverbs 16, 4. It says, the Lord has made everything for his own, what? Purpose. God has made everything for his purpose. Not for your purpose, not for your pleasure, not for your goals, ambitions, and dreams, but for his purpose. God, in other words, has a purpose for your life. Every human being has a purpose. If you're alive, if your heart is still beating, if you're still above ground, God has a purpose for you. And my passion as a pastor is to help you find God's purpose for your life. Our passion as a church is to help you find God's purpose for your life. And this is why, like, I just can't encourage you enough, like, invite you, inspire you enough to jump into the next four-week Next Step experience we have. On your campus, it begins next weekend is week number one. It's the great time to jump in. Because... It's designed to help you discover why God put you on this planet, why you're still alive, why you're still breathing. You see, here's what I know. 
you'll only find God's purpose for your life through dependence on him and healthy interdependence with others. In other words, you must rely on God and you must rely in healthy ways on other people. Why? Because you're made in the image of God. Even in the very mysterious identity of God, the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, one God, three persons, even in that identity of God is interdependence, togetherness, community, and love, and connection. And since we are made in the image of God, the only way we will find God's purpose is through dependence on him and healthy interdependence with each other. The Bible records for us in Genesis chapter one, when God was creating the world, he looked at the moon and the stars and said, it's good. He looked at the plants and animals, said, it's good. Everything made, God made was good. And then he created the first human being and it, he said, it is very good. But then in Genesis chapter two, we read the first negative comment in the history of the world. And even though the garden was a perfect place and there was no sin, no pollution, no racism at that point, Genesis 2.18, it says, God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. And so God makes another human being for the sake of relationship, for the sake of togetherness, for the sake of ending the aloneness, because God hates loneliness. Jesus knew we were hardwired for relationships with God and with each other. And you would think, like, if there's ever been a person in the history of the world that didn't need to rely on anyone, it'd be Jesus. I mean, he's God in the flesh. But let me remind you, even though he was God in the flesh, he asked a woman at a well for a drink of water. Jesus asked disciples to go get a donkey so he could ride. He asked the disciples to watch and pray with him, even though they fell asleep. And let me remind you, someone else even help Jesus carry his cross. You can only find God's purpose for your life through dependence on him and healthy interdependence with others. And this is why I wanna challenge you, ask you, inspire you to jump into week one of Next Steps next weekend if you've never done that. Like our team's gonna have coffee waiting for you. We'll watch your kids. We'll give you a backpack with some fun stuff. That you can add to it each week. And over the next four weekends, we are going to help you find the purpose for your life as you get to know God and know and connect with others. Give you a little sneak peek. One of the tools we use in Next Step is to help you find your shape, your shape which is simply an acronym to help you discover first your spiritual gifts that God has placed inside of you. We all have these unique abilities given to us by God, and yet 87% of followers of Jesus in America don't know what their gifts are. Do you know what your gifts are? H is for heart. What are the things that you're passionate about? The areas that, that are close to your heart. A is for the abilities that you have. We've all got these unique abilities. P is for your unique personality. We're all wired differently. Maybe you're an introvert, an extrovert, verbal, nonverbal. E is for the unique life experiences that all of us have from any other person on the planet. And those experiences are things that God can use in your life. God takes all of these things. God takes your shape and he puts them together to accomplish your purpose. Now, many of you are here today for various reasons. Like, some of you, you're just hurting and you thought you ought to try church, try God. Someone invited you maybe today, so you tagged along or you lost a bet and you had to come to church with someone today. Or your spouse threatened you within an inch of your life that you needed to be here for crazy, stupid love. But here's what I can promise you, no matter why you're here, if you'll jump into next steps over the next four weeks, and beyond that, I would just say, if you'll give us a year of your life at Eastside, I guarantee you, you're gonna look back 12 months from now and you're gonna say, that changed my life. And I have more joy, more freedom, more purpose than I knew would ever be possible. 
but you've got to take the step to engage. Let me say it again. You'll only find God's purpose for your life through dependence on him and healthy interdependence with others. God's dream for his church has always been that we'll be like this healthy, interdependent place where walls come down and people of different races and different sexes and different economic positions and different ages and members of the Republican Party and Democratic Party and people who just like to party and Angel fans and Dodger fans would unite and be better together. Let me try to summarize this first point this way. Number one, you have something someone else needs. Number two, someone else has something you need. Number three, reliance is interdependence where you meet the needs of each other. Now, I wanna get really practical and I want us to consider how does this play out? How does it play out in love? How does it play out in life and in relationships? Let me start by talking to those of you who are married and then I wanna circle back and I wanna to talk to those who are single. If you're married, your spouse should be the most important person on the face of the earth to you. And you should rely and depend on them. They should rely and depend on you. That's the way marriage is supposed to work. But problems happen because men and women are so different and we just drive each other crazy with our differences, and, 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 and it just creates distance between us. And distance between spouses is where Satan loves to set up shop. A woman wrote Dear Abby one time and said, Dear, Dear Abby, I'm 44 years old. I would like to meet a man my age with no bad habits. <laughs> Dear Abby responded, so would I. <laughs> Psychologists did this test with a group of people. They had people look at this sentence. They asked people to insert the commas or the punctuation wherever they thought they belonged, okay? Most of the women did it this way. Woman, without her, man is nothing. <laughs> Most of the men did it this way. Woman without her man is nothing. We're just different. Biologically, women have larger connections between the two hemispheres of their brains, and they have a tendency toward superior verbal ability. Now, I know you women don't get this. We genuinely like to be with you. We just don't wanna talk so much. <laughs> we tend to like different movies, right? Men tend to like action, shoot 'em up Jason Bourne types of movies. Women tend to like sensitive, weepy, someone's dying of a disease kind of love story. Men and women are different in so many ways. So someone said, you know, before marriage, opposites attract. After marriage, opposites attack. <laughs> and here's the deal. Those differences can create distance. So one of them says, like, really? This is the way it's going to be? I know you. I trust you. But I guess I'm just gonna have to rely on myself to do this thing. I'm gonna have to run this errand. I'm gonna have to do this project. I'm gonna have to make this decision. I'm gonna have to do life all by myself. And we may not see it at the moment, but it's creating distance and it's giving the evil one room to operate. Don't let it happen to you. Dr. Van Epp points out the research has found that satisfying relationships are characterized by a simple formula, very simple. Two people mutually meeting each other's needs. Here's the deal. There are couples with us today, right now, and there's a distance. We have some spouses with us today who are lonely in marriage, and it's like, it feels like a relational prison because they made a commitment to you and they can't go get the love and attention and conversation from someone else and so they feel stuck. And if you're married, you need to work on this because someone has forsaken all others for you alone. And now they are alone. You can do something about this. You know something I've never heard? I've never heard a spouse complain. My spouse is such a jerk because he or she is always making sacrifices to make me happy. 
You never heard that? One psychologist says our spouses need 10 meaningful physical touches a day for healthy self-esteem. We have a man in our church who's getting up there in years now, but I just absolutely love him. His name is Elwin Boucher. And before moving to California, where, you know, I live, Elwin lived for many years in my hometown of Lincoln, Illinois, where I grew up, and he and my dad were great friends. He even sang at my dad's funeral 45 years ago this August. Elwin and his wife, Mary Ann, raised four kids. And then way too early in life, in the prime of life, Mary Ann had a series of strokes and a heart surgery that led to some paralysis and a series of physical limitations for her. But for many years, Elwin lovingly helped bathe Mary Ann every day. He dressed her. He lovingly would even fix her hair every day. Shortly after I moved to California 11 years ago, I had lunch with Elwin one day, and he said, Gene, I know that the number one purpose God has for my life now is to take care of myself physically, spiritually, emotionally, so that I'm able to care for Mary Ann. Mary Ann left us too soon a few years ago and made her trip to heaven where she has a new body and no more sickness, no more paralysis. But for 61 years, she had a man in her life who she knew, she trusted, and in sickness and in health, she could rely on. That's the way marriage is supposed to work right there. It's, that's the way. Now, let me talk to you single folks. And I'm gonna go back to Romans chapter 12, verse five. We are all one body in Christ. We belong to each other and each of us needs all the other. That verse, others, that verse isn't just written to married people. It's written to everyone. And it's saying, you need to be around other people if you wanna do life as God intended you to do it. And let me remind you that Jesus relied on people, even though he never married, he was single, and he's the only perfect person to ever live on the face of the earth. 59 times in the New Testament, we're given one another commands, like love one another, serve one another, pray for one another, instruct one another, encourage one another, show hospitality to one another, on and on it goes. You cannot carry out the 59 one another commands of the New Testament while you're all by yourself watching Netflix. You got to make a point to get around other people and serve other people. And if you're single and you live alone, and I would do this if I was single and I lived alone. In fact, I did do this when I was single and lived alone for a number of years. Get to your church campus every opportunity you have to attend a service. And don't just attend. Go to serve. Be a change maker. If I wasn't married, I was living alone, I'd serve on guest services team, on parking team, on a coffee team, on a next gen team, on a production team. I would just serve so that I could be around other people. Serve through local and global compassion opportunities while you've got the freedom to do it. Some of you say, well, Gina, I just like being alone with God. <laughs> and there's power in being alone with God. Luke chapter 5, verse 16, Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. So there is power from spending time alone with God. We all need to do that. But if you're the type that says, I not only, you know, want to spend some time alone with God, but I just prefer to be alone all the time, just mark my word. You're going to hit a season, a situation a crisis in your life where you're gonna wish you had cultivated godly relationships where you rely on and are reliable for other people. You say, yeah, but I'm kind of a loner. I get that because I'm a mild introvert by wiring myself. And I went through eras of my life where I didn't think I needed anybody. It was just me and Jesus but then through a crisis years ago, I learned that never works. And God has brought different people through different eras of my life. And for a few years now, I've been in a group with some other pastors who serve dynamic churches like Eastside, and it's just life-giving to me. 
We meet regularly throughout the year. We communicate practically every day through text, emails, phone calls. One of the guys just texted me yesterday afternoon. Hey, you got a few minutes for a phone call? I know I can pick up the phone in the middle of the night and say, will you pray for me? And those guys will drop everything to pray for me. And I do the same thing for them. And if you don't have people like that in your life, watching your back, it's time to find them. And you know, Barbara needs this too. I, I know this is gonna be shocking to you. I don't meet all of her relational needs. <laughs> and she has connected with some of the other pastor's wives and they just have like this cool little sorority where they support and love each other. Ecclesiastes chapter four, verse 10 says, if one person falls, the other can reach out and help, but someone who falls alone is in real trouble. Does that remind you of a television commercial? What is it, anybody know? Help, I've fallen and I can't get up. You don't wanna be that person, okay? You may think you don't need anyone right now, and I'm not trying to scare you. I'm trying to prepare you because there will be a day or a season when you will wish you had taken the risk to rely on other people. And listen to me, there will also be a day, there will be a season in your life where you will wish you had risked to rely on a relationship with God if you haven't done that. I know many of you, you really struggle with trusting and relying on God or even the belief that God is out there and some of you, you doubt for really good reasons. Maybe you grew up in church and you knew all the answers in Sunday school, but then you kind of like headed off to college and, and you were just kind of unprepared for what hit you. Maybe there was a roommate that was a devout atheist, a professor who began to belittle belief in the Bible as naive and simplistic. Maybe there were people talking about how many bad things Christianity had done throughout world history, and then you added in some of your own doubts, and finally, you found yourself skeptical about God. Maybe you've lost loved ones, and you think God has forgotten about you. Maybe you've done some really bad things in your life, and you think God's disgusted with you. Maybe you're a child of divorce, and you've never really gotten over it. Maybe you were damaged and deeply hurt by a church or a church leader or pastor along the way. Maybe you were abused or neglected or hurt really badly in life. Maybe you prayed to God and you don't feel like he helped you, that he heard you. Listen, 1 Timothy 6.21 says, some people have missed the most important thing in life. They don't know God. This is this is the most important thing in life, knowing God. And some of you, you know about God, but you don't really know him to the point of trusting and relying on him. And some of you, maybe today, you may say, well, well I think maybe I'm an atheist. Good, I'm glad you're here. Well, then maybe what you ought to do is say the atheist prayer. <laughs> Just pray. You say, well, prayer. I don't even believe God's there. You pray like this. God, I don't believe you're there. You just say that. I don't think you're hearing me right now, but if I'm wrong, I want to find out about you. Open my eyes to the truth and give me the courage to respond to the evidence that I'll find. Friends, God has answered that prayer for millions of people, and he will for you. He wants to, because you can only find the purpose for your life through dependence on him and healthy interdependence with others. I like how the Amplified Version of the Bible puts John chapter one, verse 12. It kind of pulls out a few words and defines them in the verse. It says, to as many as did receive and welcome him, Jesus, he gave the right, the authority, the privilege to become children of God. That is, to those who believe in, adhere to, trust in, and rely on his name. Did you ever play the game trusty when you were a kid? Or maybe you, you called it by a different name, but my dad used to like uh, stand a few paces behind us and we'd stand in front of him and we couldn't see him. We just had to trust that like he's back there. 
And then we would start leaning backwards, leaning backwards, leaning backwards, leaning backwards until we'd fall over and we were trusting that he would be there to catch us so that we didn't fall and crack our little head open on the floor. And most of the time he did a pretty good job. Now, if you've ever played this, you know there's a point in the game where you're going backwards where you kind of reach that point of no return. At first, you're leaning back, you're leaning back, and you can fake it, you know, you can step back up, you can stay in control if you want to. Now, you can know and you can trust that there's someone back there who is able to catch you. But you'll never really know if they can catch you until you abandon control and you go back far enough so that you rely on the faithfulness of the one in whom you trust. You're placing yourself in their arms. That's the way the game works. That's why it's called trusty. This is what the God of the universe who loves you so much, who loves you with a crazy, stupid love that he gave his only son for you and invites you to do, to throw yourself into his arms and to adhere to, and to trust in, and to rely on his name. And when you do, he will be there to catch you. And some of you, you know about Jesus. You believe who he says he is, the Messiah, the Savior. But the question is, have you put your full weight of your life on him? Have you relied on him? him alone for your salvation. You could take the risk to rely on him right now for your salvation. Let's all bow our heads together. Please nobody move or head for the door. I want to just take this moment because I think this is an important moment. And if this is what you want, if you want to rely on Jesus, I'm gonna invite you to, to just do that right now. You don't have to come forward. You don't have to do anything weird today. Just pray this humble prayer of faith, just silently right where you are and just say, Jesus, today, I put my complete faith and reliance on you to be my forgiver, my leader. I received the payment that you made on a cross for me. You, you died for me. I wanna live for you. So I choose to follow you. you're truly relying on him. I mean, you mean it today. You're not just faking it. You want to put your full weight on him. Then if you're sincere, you'll do what he asks you to do. And the first thing he asks you to do is to express that faith by celebrating, by being baptized, to symbolize this transformation. So I would just ask you, let us know you made this decision to follow Jesus on your connection card today before you leave and indicate your interest in baptism and just drop it off one of the giving boxes on your way out today. And our team will follow up with you. I want to ask our campus pastors and hosts to close in prayer at each site right now. And I'll close here. God, I thank you that you have proven trustworthy and reliable in my own life over and over and over and over again for decades. And I am just so excited for those who are choosing to put their faith in and truly rely on Jesus today. Thank you for making each of us with a purpose for our lives, for numbering our days before a one of them came to be. And God, I pray that in the weeks ahead, many will choose to discover that purpose, jump into next steps, take that courageous step of learning why you put them on this planet. May we reflect that purpose as we rely on you and one another every day. Keep your hand on this series and our relationships, God, I ask in Jesus' name and for his sake. And everybody said, amen.